However, so far, he has not determined the reason for the overheating condition that was originally reported on the bearing. The next step that he needs to do is to check what's commonly referred to as the oil clearance or running clearance of the bearing. As you'll recall, we said the journal of a plane bearing normally operated on a film of oil. The clearance between the journal and the shells of the bearing, when the journal is centered in the bearing, is called the oil clearance or running clearance. Now obviously this running clearance can affect the operation of the bearing. If it's improper, either too large or too small, it could result in overheating. So to determine this clearance, the workman has to measure the diameter of the journal, that is the shaft that runs in the bearing. He also has to measure the inside diameter of the shells. From this information, he can then calculate the oil clearance for the bearing. So he's down there now, measuring the diameter of the shaft. Let's join him. To measure the journal diameter, he makes use of a vernier caliper. Now in other cases, it may be just as convenient, or more convenient, to use an outside micrometer. But in this case, a micrometer wouldn't fit into the location required, so a vernier caliper is being used. He takes several readings. He takes readings at at least two locations on the shaft, and at each location that he takes a measurement, he actually takes two, one at 90 degrees to the other. This way, if the shaft has an out-of-round condition, this too can be detected. Now, it's important that these measurements be performed slowly and carefully. The clearance that will be calculated from these measurements is relatively small, so any mistake in measuring can have a big effect on the results. And of course, as you see here, each measurement is carefully noted. So he continues performing measurements, as I said, at two locations on the journal, with two measurements at each location, one 90 degrees from the other. The results of all diameter measurements are carefully noted so that they can be used for calculation and compared to manufacturer's specifications. At this point, the oil is finished draining from the reservoir in the bottom half of the bearing housing, so the bucket used to contain the oil can be moved and set aside. Next comes an extremely important step. Since he won't be doing any further work around the journal or the lower half of the bearing housing for some time, he needs to cover them. The procedures in our facility call for the use of plastic sheeting together with masking tape to form a protective cover over exposed machine parts. The cover does several things. It minimizes the possibility of dirt or other contamination getting into the open parts, and it also protects them from accidental damage caused by something falling or dropping on them. The procedures used in your facility may be different. In some places where it's likely that things may fall or be dropped on the machine parts, a wooden covering may be used, say a piece of plywood or something like that. So it's important to follow facility procedures, but the most important thing to remember is that these exposed machine parts must be covered. At this point, our workman has completed half the job of determining bearing oil clearance. He knows the diameter of the bearing journal. The next thing he needs to determine is the diameter of the bearing shells. He's preparing to perform this next important measuring step. Let's rejoin him and see how it's done. The first step here is to remove the shell from the top half of the bearing housing. But before he does this, he carefully checks to be sure that marks are already provided to identify the proper orientation of the shell. By matching these marks, the housing can be reinstalled properly. If there weren't any marks, he would of course match mark these parts. He also checks that there is an identification mark on the lower bearing shell so that he can ensure himself that they're assembled properly when he puts them back together. Next, then, he needs to remove that top shell from the top half of the bearing housing. Now, the method of attachment varies from one unit to another. In this particular example, the top shell is attached to the top half of the bearing housing with two machine screws. So the screws must be removed first. He loosens them with a screwdriver and then lifts them out by hand and sets them aside. But, as with the other small parts, he doesn't just put them on the table. He removes them and places them in a suitable container, in this case, a plastic bag. This ensures that the parts aren't lost or damaged during maintenance work. Then he turns the bearing housing over before removing the shell. You'll notice he holds the shell in position to be sure that it doesn't drop out of the housing. After finding that it cannot be easily removed by hand, he again makes use of a hammer and hardwood dowel in order to start rolling it out of the housing. It doesn't take a lot of force, 
just tapping with a hammer on the dowel begins movement of the shell. Then, once it's been broken loose, it can be removed by hand. Now what's required here is to reassemble the two bearing shells in order to measure the inside diameter of the assembled bearing unit. So he sets the top housing aside and out of the way. Then he's ready to put the two shells together, paying careful attention to the identifying marks to be sure that they fit together the right way. In this particular bearing, holes are provided in the two shells. The manufacturer provides alignment dowels, which can be placed in these holes when assembling the bearing for just the purpose that we're seeing here, measuring its inside diameter. So the workman takes the two alignment dowels, or dowel pins if you will, and places them in the holes provided in one of the two bearing shells, in this case the upper shell. He then takes the second shell and places it into position over the dowel pins, taking care to be sure that the two marks match up. Then, with the unit assembled, he places two clamps on it. Now, these particular clamps are specially fabricated ones that we use for this purpose. However, this isn't always necessary. In many cases, simple hose clamps will do. The important thing is that the two bearing shells are assembled in their proper orientation and then clamp together properly before the measurements are taken. So two clamps are used, one on either end of the assembly. And with the two clamps in position, their bolts are tightened up. First, he threads the nuts on by hand, and then uses wrenches to complete the tightening. Now you'll notice as he does this, he tightens one clamp and then moves to the second clamp. He'll continue to go back and forth several times to complete the final tightening. In this way, stress is drawn evenly on the bearings, and the possibility of any distortion is minimized. Once he's finished tightening the clamps, the assembly is now together, and he's ready to measure its inside diameter. To do this, he makes use of a telescoping gauge, or as it's frequently called, a snap gauge, and an outside micrometer. The telescope engage is placed inside the assembled bearing halves and expanded until its size is the same as the inside diameter of the bearing. Then it's locked in that position, removed, and it's measured with an outside micrometer to determine what the dimension is at that point. Now, as when he was measuring the outside diameter of the bearing journal, after performing a measurement and verifying it, he logs it carefully on the form that's used for this purpose in our facility. Each measurement must be carefully logged if the numbers are going to mean anything. After making note of this number, the measurement is then repeated at the same location, except 90 degrees to the original measurement. Again, the reason for this is the same as the one for taking two readings at each location on the bearing journal to check for an out-of-round or egg-shaped condition. So he repeats the same steps, 90 degrees away from the original measurement location. He expands the telescoping gauge until it matches the diameter, locks it in position, removes it, and then measures it with an outside micrometer. As with the first measurement taken, after he's verified this one, it too is logged on his data sheet. Now he needs to perform the same measurements in the other end of the unit. Again, this is similar to the measurements taken on the bearing journal. You remember, he measured two different locations on the journal. So he turns the assembled bearing halves over so that he's now measuring in the other end and then repeats the steps that we've just seen. That is, he will perform two measurements here also, one 90 degrees from the other, to determine the diameter at this point and also to see whether or not an egg-shaped or out-of-round condition exists. At the conclusion of these steps, he will have measurements of both the bearing journal outside diameter and the bearing shell inside diameter. So what will he do next? Well, at this point, he has some calculations to perform. What he needs to do is subtract the journal outside diameter from the shell inside diameter and then divide that number by two. This will give him the oil clearance around the journal if the bearing was assembled. 
And of course, he needs to repeat this calculation for each location that measurements were taken because it can vary from one place to another. And if it does, he needs to know it. Now, what's he do with the final result of his calculations? He compares it with manufacturer specifications, which can be found in the manufacturer's instruction book, to determine whether or not the oil clearance is satisfactory. So those are the basic steps involved then in determining the oil clearance of a plain journal bearing or sleeve bearing. While our workman completes his calculations and then performs a comparison of his measured oil clearance with the specified oil clearance in the manufacturer's instruction book, I think what I'd like you to do is to stop the tape, take a short break, and review the measurements.